Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to get into advice that I wish I knew when I was a new cook starting out in this industry. Stay tuned. So before we begin, let me give you just a brief update. I'm recording this on a Saturday. On Monday of this week, I'll be in Dallas cooking at Jose Restaurant. There's a few tickets still available. It's part of Texas Food and Wine Alliance Wine and Dine Series. It's going to be Chef Anastasia Quinones from Jose Restaurant in Dallas, Philip Spear from Comedor in Austin, Texas, Rick Lopez from La Condesa in Austin, Texas, obviously myself from Chef's PSA. Don't have a restaurant. I'm retired. But it's a good opportunity for me to get out and cook with some friends because sometimes I do miss cooking. If you happen to be in Dallas, it's a great dinner. It supports Texas Food and Wine Alliance. And I haven't cooked in a while in this style. So I'm on the hot seafood course, which in this case is an octopus dish. So I'll tell you all about the dish that I'm making. Now, keep in mind, this is a Mexican food inspired dinner, but the parameters are a little loose. And of course, you know, the chefs are going to put their own interpretation on some of the food. So in my case, I'm doing a grilled octopus, just the tentacle, which in this case we cook in the steamer and I lay the tentacles out straight. And the reason I lay them out straight is so that when they cook, the tentacle will remain straight versus uh, getting curly. Sometimes when you poach octopus, it curls up. I want the tentacle straight. So cook it in a steamer. Um, and the way that they lay is they lay against each other. So that way there's no opportunity for them to curl. Anyway, it's a good little trick that I'm sharing with people. If you're having trouble keeping your octopus tentacle straight, that's how you do it. After that, I'm going to throw it on the grill. I'm going to brush it with a glaze that I made with tamarind, some chili, some garlic, a little Mexican sugar called piloncillo, which is like, um, it's like a, a cane sugar that's compressed almost think of it like palm sugar uh, in thai cooking i'm serving that with some fresh peas that are going to be lightly dressed with an, av an avocado leaf oil and a pea pipian so pipian is like um, i guess you could almost call it like a green mole made with pumpkin seeds in this case i'm also putting the addition of peas in it because i want a little bit more green but anyway that's that's the dish so it's a grilled octopus tentacle with a pea pipian made with real pea Anyway, I don't talk about food often enough, but that's the course. I haven't cooked in a long time, so hopefully the dish comes out good. I'm being modest. It's going to be good. Anyway, so someone messaged me the other day and asked me if I did the book in Spanish, which I, I don't have the books in Spanish, but it got me thinking, I'm going to translate these books in Spanish. So I said, well, I might as well do it. So I'm in the process of translating the books. I thought it would be rather easy. I said, oh, how hard could it be to translate a book? It is time consuming. So right now I'm in the process of translating the first book, in this case, Culinary Leadership Fundamentals. I'm working on that into a Spanish translation. That will probably take me about another week or two to complete, but then after that I'll start doing the remaining books. It'll most likely go in this order, Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, then the Line Cook Survival Manual, then Bad Sue, Good Chef, um, and we'll, we'll see how that goes, and then maybe I'll do the, the last two. But... Yes, Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, for those of you that have been asking, I will translate that to Spanish in the next few weeks. The remaining audiobook to get done, Bad Sue, Good Chef, it's done, it's just not out. It's in the uh, approval phase, so um, Audible drags their feet to approve books. But anyway, the book's been done since June 10th, and here we are. Today's June 24th, and the book's still not approved, so anyway. Any day now, it should be out. Then all the books will have audiobooks as companions for those of you that like to read with your ears versus your eyes. Sometimes I'm one of those people too. Anyway, let's get into it. So what I really want to talk about in this episode was advice that I would give to myself or advice that I would give to a young chef if they were just starting out in the industry. Now, the reason I think this episode is important is because we have a high turnover in this industry and a lot of people get stuck and they hit a wall and they, sometimes they hit a wall too early in their career and they, uh, they want to move up, but they, they don't know where to look and they don't know who to turn to. And I think we often are afraid of making decisions 
because it's been so long since we've made the right decision. So we are in this perpetual sort of fear of making a bad decision because we think, well, my time has passed, so there's no sense in making a good decision now. It's kind of like, you know, the old expression, when's the best time to plant a tree? And they'll say 10 years ago, when's the second best time today, right? Whether we're talking planting trees or sometimes it's breaking up with a partner or maybe it's in making an investment or starting a new diet, whatever the case may be. Sometimes we have a very short time preference, but we need to have a longer time preference. And so what would the person in 10 years from now tell you like, Hey, it's not too late to start that diet because you're going to suffer for it 10 years from now, or it's not too late to make that work decision because you're going to be affected by it 10 years into the future. So even though this is advice for a new cook, sometimes it might not be advice for a new cook. It might be advice for a cook that's been in the business for quite some time and just maybe needs to hear this right about now because it's never too late to make a good decision. You're under no obligation to be the person you were five minutes ago. Now that's, that's an interesting expression and I like it. And I actually, I wrote that in uh, the most recent book and part of the closing, you're under no obligation to be the person you were five minutes ago. And what that means is that sometimes you need to allow yourself the ability to change your mind, but let's get into the advice. What would be the first thing I would tell someone? If I could go back and tell this to a new chef, I, th th by the way, this is the same advice I would give myself. Because a lot of the things that I'm going to tell you today are things that held me back. And so maybe, maybe this is a little bit of therapy too. Anyway, the first thing I would say is work in great kitchens and surround yourself with people that are better than you. I know when I was a young cook, I, and, and by the way, I did work in good kitchens. I sought out the best kitchens in the city where I was in, but I didn't seek out the best kitchens in the world. And I was living on my own and I, I had the ability to live anywhere because I was supporting myself and I was basically a nomad when I had just gotten out of culinary school. But I chose a little bit of a safe route and safe places to live. And so I was living in secondary markets when I could have been living in primary markets like LA or San Francisco or New York. And, and realistically, what I would have told myself is if you have the ability to live in those markets, go live in those markets and work in the best restaurants in those cities, because it's easy to get in those restaurants when you're young than it is as time goes on. So I'll give you an example. It would probably be easier for a 19 year old cook to get into a three Michelin star restaurant than it would be for a 29 year old cook to start out in a three Michelin star restaurant. And that usually has to do with, they in, in a lot of high end restaurants, they wanna start you early because you don't really have any bad habits and they're able to shape you early on in your career and introduce good habits, your skill set early on, as opposed to you may have had, again, using the 29 year old cook, you may have had nine years of bad habits already built in and it might be tougher to break them later on. So if you have the opportunity, work in the best kitchens that you can possibly work in, whether that's a primary market, whether that's a secondary market, whether that's in your town, Maybe you're in culinary school right now. Find the best restaurant in the city where you go to school and try and work there. It's going to give you a significant advantage in your career to start out in those kitchens. Now, I will say that they are harder a lot of times, but when you're introduced to it early on in your career, that's the frame of reference of what you have as kitchen. So it's easy to go from a very high-end, difficult kitchen to go to an easy kitchen. It's going to seem like, well, this is, this is a cakewalk versus the other way around. If you start out in a very easy kitchen and then you go to a very serious kitchen, you're gonna be like, oh shit, this is hard. It's a lot harder than I thought. And so I would say start out in as high level of a kitchen as you could get into. Because if you keep thinking to yourself, I'll do it when I get better, or I need to get more skills, or I'm not ready, trust me, when you get there, you're not gonna be ready regardless, so you might as well go now. The sooner you get in there, the sooner you will prepare yourself. So it's like the idea of learning how to swim. Like you can't say, oh, well, the water's too cold or when my legs get stronger, or maybe when I'm a little bit taller, I'll get in the water. Like, no, the best way to learn how to swim is just jump in the water and start swimming. Of course, with safety, but you get the point. Next thing I would say is find a mentor early on in your career. Find someone that you trust and ideally in a position that you aspire to have. I've been very fortunate in my career that I've had great mentors, not just in culinary. And by the way, someone asked me this the other day, so I should probably expand upon it. Even if you can't get a mentor that's a chef, you should still have a mentor, someone that's wise and successful, 
and has experienced life. And I'm not talking about someone that's just a year older than you or two years older than you. You would like them to be ideally at an age where you're, you're not going to be buddies, but you're going to be able to respect that mentor mentee relationship. So almost like a parent. And when you have a mentor and if you have a good one, listen to them, take their advice. They most likely see things from a different angle. They've been through things. They have a lot of life experience and different perspectives. A mentor can guide you. A mentor can open doors for you. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, if you're working in a great kitchen and you happen to find a mentor in that great kitchen, maybe it's the chef, which would be the ideal situation. It's kind of like the chef Illuminati, right? If you have a good mentor in a really high-end restaurant, most likely they've also worked in high-end restaurants and they have chef friends that are in other high-end restaurants. And when the time comes, they're able to just pick up the phone and say, hey, I have someone for you. And all these doors start opening for you. So having a good mentor will open a lot of doors for you. Now, the next one kind of ties in with people opening doors for you, and that is don't burn bridges. When you first start out, your circle of influence might be the people that you worked with in culinary school or your first job. And that might be like 20 people, that's all you know that are chefs. Now, if you could imagine that every year you're meeting about 20 or 30 people, in your first year, your network is rather small. 30 people, first year of cooking. Well, Let's expand that over the course of time. If you've been cooking for 10 years, that might be 300 people that you know and 300 people that know you who mention your name to other people. So your reputation becomes exponential. So you might not think that what you're doing is affecting your career and your reputation, but it is. So it's very important to not burn bridges. Don't lie on your resume. Don't think that people don't call each other. I've had people call me up and say, did this person work for you as a sous chef? And it blew my mind because I'm thinking, why would they lie on their resume? They didn't work for me as a sous chef. And they assumed that this person didn't know me where they were applying. Or I've had employees go apply somewhere and the chef calls me up because we're friends and say, hey, just so you know, one of your employees is trying to work here. I'm telling you, this happens more than people realize. You could burn your reputation very easily. And so we talked about this chef Illuminati. Understand that when you work in a great place, if they have a lot of connections, then you could potentially be hurting yourself with all their connections if people are making phone calls. So don't burn your bridge. Be respectful. If you're going to quit, make sure you give a proper notice, whether that's a minimum of two weeks or longer, a month, whatever the case may be. Make sure that you're not burning bridges. As the expression goes, the same people that you see on the way up are sometimes going to be the same people that you see on the way down. The next thing I would say to people is don't be afraid to fail. I've worked places myself included, where I've been afraid to do something because I didn't know how to do it. When you first start out cooking, one of the amazing things is that you don't know anything and you're so excited because they're showing you all these new techniques and you go home and you try and practice at home and it's so new and it's so fun. But eventually you get to a certain point in your career where you're supposed to know a certain amount. And that's really where it becomes difficult because now if you go and you demonstrate that you don't know how to do something, there's that fear of what are people going to say if I don't know how to do it? Are they going to laugh at me? Maybe you're in a position of authority and they don't know. And excuse me, you don't know how to do something. So you're afraid that the rest of the team is going to laugh at you. That's a very real fear that a lot of people have. I know I've had that fear. Sometimes I don't know how to do something and I'm kind of embarrassed to say, hey, I don't know how to do that because you feel like you're going to look foolish. Now, it gets worse the higher up you get. So if you can imagine that as a cook, well, then when you're a sous chef and you're an executive chef and so on, when you don't know something, it could be a little bit frustrating. But really, no one cares. It's that whole spotlight effect that no one, no one really cares what you don't know. Yeah, maybe they're going to snicker a little bit, but who cares? The biggest thing is that's holding you back. And I, I had to learn this lesson the hard way because I would be afraid to learn new things because I was afraid of not knowing. And then eventually I had to get over it. And something I used to say to myself, and sometimes you'll see this in the caption on some of the chef's PSA posts is I'll write on the other side of fear is greatness. And I don't know if I invented that. I'm pro I probably didn't. I probably heard it somewhere or read it somewhere, but it stayed with me and it stayed in my subconscious. And whenever I was afraid to do something, whatever the case may be, I would always say to myself, on the other side of fear is greatness. It never didn't work out in my favor. Anytime I tried to overcome something that I was afraid of, it was never as bad as I thought. And the end result was always better. I used to get to the point where I would say things that I didn't know how to do as much as possible just so I could learn new stuff. And at first people would kind of snicker like, oh, 
chef doesn't know how to do that. And I'd be like, yeah, I don't. But trust me, there's a lot that I do know how to do. And whenever I would see something I didn't know, I would want to just learn it and absorb it. I'm still that way now. I'm learning so much with what I do with Chef's PSA and interacting with uh, a lot of the chefs that comment or send me DMs. Because sometimes they have a different perspective with, than how I view things. And, when, and they challenge me on my, on my paradigm on how I see things. It's good for me because I'm like, hmm, they have a good point. Or eh, it doesn't make sense, whatever, I'm going I'm to ignore it. But don't be afraid of not knowing and don't be afraid to fail. There's something called fear inoculation, and that is introducing things that you're afraid of gradually, little by little by little. And sometimes I would put myself in situations where I knew I would lose. And that might be like I would have a, a race with someone breaking down a chicken or let's see who could fillet a salmon faster. And uh, so like, like, let's say the record was like a minute and 30 seconds, they could, they could fillet a salmon, not, not debone it, but just um, fillet it. And I would say, okay, I could beat that time and maybe I got it down to a minute and then someone else would come in and beat my time and get it down to 45 seconds or whatever. The fastest I've ever seen anyone do it, not pin bone, but head off end to end, 13 seconds. It was pretty fast. Anyway, this guy was good with fish. We digress. Shout out to Paul Petal. If you're listening, he was the 13 second salmon man. Anyway, he's from Newfoundland. Said he would grow up with fish. So that's why he was so good. Point being is that sometimes you have to introduce yourself to things that you're afraid of. And maybe you might even lose because that'll get, get you over the fear of failure. I don't talk about this often, but in my previous life, I used to do a lot of fighting, mixed martial arts, Muay Thai, kickboxing, stuff like that. And I was decently pretty good. Like I, I you know, amateur level, not pro, but I was pretty good. I, I, had, off, I had an offer at one point to turn pro, but I, I didn't take it. I ended up going the chef route. Anyway, long story short is one of the things that held me back when I was in my MMA days in training was I was like the best one in the gym. But the only reason I was the best one in the gym is because I refused to spar with people that were better than me because I didn't want to lose. So I only liked being the hammer, but did not like being the nail. So on the days that the guys that were better than me would show up, I would be like, I would, I would avoid them in sparring, or maybe I wouldn't show up those days because I didn't want to get beat because I felt like everything was a competition. Even training was a competition. Now, what ended up going wrong with that is that my growth and development in, in the fight kind of hit a wall. Like I, I was not improving. And I noticed that people that I was better than started to catch up to me and everyone started to get to my level, which kind of made me nervous because I was like, I'm not improving and everyone else is getting better around me. And the reason they were getting better is because they weren't afraid of getting beat up. They would just go in there. They didn't have an ego. They didn't care about losing, but I did. I really cared about losing. Even in the gym, I didn't want to lose. So one day I came up with this idea that I needed to get over the fear of losing. So what I did was I went to the gym and it was a sparring day. And for those of you that know what I'm talking about, you'll get this. But if you, if you don't, like uh, when you're sparring in MMA, it could be like punches and kicks or it could be groundwork with submissions. That day I went in and I was like, I'm going to get beat by everybody. I need everyone that I'm going to spar with to beat me. So I went in and I don't know, let's say I sparred with like 10 guys that day. Every single one tapped me. Some of them really tapped me. Um, and some of them I let tap me. But I just wanted to get over the feeling of losing. And I lost to everyone that day. Some on purpose, some not on purpose. But I made sure that I lost to everyone. And you know what? No one cared. It didn't matter but it allowed me to get over that fear. And then I was able to get better. So I took that same principle and I applied it to the kitchen. I was no longer afraid of not knowing and I was no longer afraid of losing, which allowed me to continue to learn in the kitchen. So as I said, on the other side of fear is greatness. And that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of a life lesson, but it definitely applies to the kitchen. Once you get over your fear of not knowing, because look, trust me, there's no chef out there that knows everything. And every chef out there has had that doubt in their mind. But remember how fun it is to be new and a learner and adding new skills to your repertoire. So don't be afraid of not knowing. It's, it's not affecting anyone else but you. And the benefits of going in with a beginner's mindset are so much greater than the consequences of losing. Next thing I'll say is you have to get off zero, meaning that you have to make decisions. As we said earlier, just get jumping in the water. You have to take action. 
the person who takes action and takes charge of their own career is going to be exponentially more successful than the person who is afraid to take action. And we've all seen this in the kitchen. You've seen this in life. Why does that person get promoted and this person doesn't? Or you'll be in a kitchen for a long time and this person doesn't get promoted and then they quit. And then you hear about them like two years later, they're a sous chef somewhere else or they're an executive chef somewhere else and they moved up the ladder simply by leaving. They weren't afraid to take the risk and they understood like, I have to take action in my own career or I need to make sure I go to the chef and let them know that I am interested in the job and I am interested in moving up. Waiting around and waiting for someone to tap you on the shoulder and say, the job is yours. We've all been waiting for you. Here's a parade. It, it doesn't work that way. You are in the driver's seat and no one is going to come and save you. Nobody. No one's going to rescue you. Not even your mentor. Your mentor is going to guide you, but they're not going to rescue you. If you want something to happen in your career, you need to be the one taking action. You have to get off zero. As I said, the person who acts has every single advantage over the person who does not act. Next, I would tell myself to step up when the opportunity presents itself. Sometimes we're reluctant to suggest a dish, you know, when they're saying, all right, chefs come up with the dishes for specials and, and you're afraid because you don't want people to judge your food. Or the chef will say, who wants to go with me to an event or who's willing to pick up the extra shift? Whatever the case may be, if you are able to step up, you should step up. Don't always look at it in what's in it for me. Because sometimes what's in it for you, you can't see immediately. Sometimes that benefit of stepping up is the goodwill that you're building with the person that's asking you to step up. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Whenever I would ask someone who wants to go with me here, and unfortunately I can't afford to pay you, but I just need a pair of hands. A lot of people would say, no, I don't want to go because I'm not getting paid. And that's understandable. But every now and again, someone would say, yeah, I'll go. I just want to get the experience. And then you know what? That person becomes your protege. You get to talk to them. You start to mentor them. That might be your end to get them to become your mentor. That might be your end to know that you want to move into a sous chef position. That might be the one-on-one -on -one time that you need to improve your skills because you may be able to talk to them and say, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in learning this, that, and the other. Can you teach me? Sometimes stepping up opens up doors and creates opportunity. So don't always be afraid to step up because you don't see the immediate incentive. Because sometimes that incentive is that rapport that you're building with that person. It's the favor for a favor kind of attitude. You're going to take care of them now. They're going to take care of you later. I mean, I, I know situations where someone will step up and go to an event with them. And then like they do something really stupid and then it, that should get them fired. But they're like, I'm not going to fire them. They're a good person, right? They're a good guy, whatever. They help me out over here. Like you'd be surprised how far that goodwill goes. Now let's reverse that and think about this just for a moment. Let's say you don't step up and you, they've consistently asked you, hey, can you help me? You're like, no, I can't, no, I can't, no, I can't. Well, then when the time comes, the person who has stepped up has every single advantage over you. And then maybe when you're in a situation where it's like you made a simple mistake, you might be held feet to the fire a little bit more than the person who does step up. So keep that in mind. The goodwill that you're building when you're asked to step up goes a long way. So don't be afraid to step up. That's something that you could learn early on in your career. The person who can step up and does has a significant advantage over the person who says no. Next thing, get good habits early on in your career. When you, when you work in really good kitchens, usually everyone has really good habits, so it's good. But if you get into bad habits early on in your career, it's going to be very hard to break them later on in your career. So you want to make sure that you have as many good habits as you can. And that might mean like, Perfect Brunois skills, trying to slice the onion just perfect. The way you set up your station, immaculate. Your knives are always sharp. You don't wipe your hands on your aprons. You fold your towels. You don't kick doors with your feet. That kind of stuff. Like picking up those good habits early on will help you significantly in your career. I used to run a pretty serious kitchen. And I, you know, I, I've talked about this before on other podcasts. Sometimes I'd be called Chef Picky, but I was very meticulous on every single standard that I had in the kitchen from how you fold your towels to how you would greet people. And after a little bit of time, people that had worked with me in that kitchen and they'd go somewhere else, a lot of times they'd come back and be like, I, I can't, seeing so many people with bad habits is hard for me to work. On top of that, they would also get complimented when they go into other kitchens, they'd be like, wow, you work really well. 
So like I said, good habits go a long way and they will be the foundation for your career moving forward. So try and get as many good habits as you can. And honestly, you're, you're not dumb. You're in a kitchen, you know what your bad habits are. You might not want to admit you know what your bad habits are, but trust me, you know what your bad habits are. So you gotta be a little bit self-critical sometimes so you can identify opportunities where you can improve. The last thing I'll say, it's kind of twofold. One, you will get better with time. When you first start out cooking, you think, I don't know how to do this and I don't know how to do that. And I, 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 I'm not fast on the line and I, and I don't know how to braise or whatever the case may be, whatever you think is holding you back, you think you're never going to improve, but trust me, you will get better. You will be able to organize tickets in your mind. Your knife skills will get faster. Your food will get tastier. You will become more organized. No one gets there overnight and cooking professionally is a process of gradual improvement over time. It's impossible to do something for eight hours a day or longer and not improve. So you have to realize that you will get better. So on those days that seem very difficult and maybe it seems hopeless because you think I did this wrong or I did that wrong and I can't cook a steak and I don't know my steak temperatures, understand you will get better. With practice, everything will become easy. Now, the second part to that, and this is going to be some tough advice, is that you have to know when it's not for you. If you're going home every day and saying, I don't like this job because I can't cook a steak and my knife skills are crap and I don't know the recipes, all that can be learned, right? Your knife skills will get better. You will learn how to cook a steak. You will be able to organize yourself better. But if you're going home and you're saying, I don't like standing on my feet all day for eight hours. I don't like working in a high pace environment. I don't like dealing with people. I don't like being told what to do. I don't like the heat of the kitchen. Then the reality is that part doesn't change. You will get better at the skills, but the environment usually doesn't change. Kitchens are still going to be hot. You still have to work standing on your feet. Realistically, it's not going to be less than eight hours a day. People are going to call off. You are going to work with people that you don't like. And unless you're the chef, you are going to be told what to do. And you may be in that position of being told what to do for many years before you become the chef that tells people what to do. But even keep in mind, the chef is usually still taking orders from somebody, ownership, etc. So if what you don't like about the industry is not things that are able to be changed in any restaurant out there or any kitchen out there, then at a certain point, you have to say, maybe this industry isn't for me. And this is a tough conversation that not a lot of people want to hear. I, I might catch some crap for this, but I think it's important that if you realize that you don't like the industry, don't stay with it because you think you have no other option. There's always other options. And I've said this before, there's no job out there that's worth sacrificing your physical health or your mental health for. And if it's just not for you, it's just not for you. And that's okay. It's better that you understand that early on because a lot of chefs will stay in the business for 15, 20 years and, and, and they realize that they have not liked it for 15 or 20 years. Some people love it. Some people don't. Just like everything in life, sometimes it's not for everybody. There's people that are diehard cooks and diehard chefs. I know I used to be that way. I would say, you will never see me do anything else other than being a chef. And here I am making memes and talking shit on a podcast. Anyway. That's the advice I would have given to myself. And that's the advice I'd give to a young cook is it's going to be hard. There's going to be some days that suck. My grandfather used to say this, no matter how bad things get, bad luck doesn't last a hundred years. And there's not an idiot who will put up with bad luck for a hundred years either. So anyway, that's it for today. Thank you all. If you want to support the show, I'm on YouTube now. So anytime you see my face, just put a thumbs up or a like. So any, anywhere you see my face, like it or leave five stars, whatever the case may be. You buy the book, you leave five stars. You listen to the podcast, you leave five stars. You're on YouTube, you subscribe and you leave the thumbs up button. If you want to support the show, there's somewhere on Spotify where you could donate. I appreciate that. That helps, that helps keep the show going. You can go get the books, Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, Bad Sue, Good Chef, Line Cook Survival Manual, Kitchen Art of War, How Not to Be the Biggest Idiot of the Kitchen. Chefspsa.com is newly revised. You can go on there and all the books are on nice, 
and neat and organized on one page. If you're in Dallas, come check us out at the Jose dinner. Thank you all. See you next week. Hit the porno music.